<clears throat> Following on with Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus continues to just give one teaching, revelation, truth, right after another. He says in Matthew 20, verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed, and this is a key word, when he has agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle. And he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. Notice that. We'll get back to that here in a minute. Whatever is right. He didn't even tell them how much. So they went. And again, he went out about the sixth and then the ninth hour, and he did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. Whatever is right, you will receive. This is going to be the, the bottom line of this parable. Whatever is right. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, <clears throat> Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. When those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. Now they're the last folks. See, they've just been there for just a little while. The original folks that he hired, he said, that's what I'm going to pay you is a denarius. Now these folks have only been working for about an hour, and he paid them a denarius. So when the first came, they supposed they'd seen what had happened. They supposed that they would receive more. Well, that makes sense to a human mind. Maybe he's up the ante here. Since he's given these folks that came last what he told us he would give us, then he must be planning to give us more. But they likewise received each a denarius. When they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and says, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? And of course the answer is yes. He said, take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? The last will be first, the first last. And many are called, but few are chosen. We'll come to both of those things. They're separate things that are similar. Now, one of the issues, obviously, in this parable has to do with what is right and what is wrong. Righteousness. There is only one source of righteousness in all the world. We'll get to that here in a moment. And that's God himself. But the problem is, uh, there is a human wisdom that's not entirely always wrong. And if you add A and B together, or one and two together, you figure you're going to get a certain result. So what happened in this parable, and Jesus obviously is, is messing with us a little bit, because what he did is the landowner started with an agreement with someone, you work in the vineyard today and I'm going to give you this amount of money. And he actually did do that. He gave them exactly what he said he was going to do. But what messed everybody up, this is where human righteousness gets in the mix at times. We'll talk of here in a moment. They had people that had worked then maybe seven hours, some maybe five hours, maybe three, and then ultimately there was one or two or three that, that worked one hour. And they heard because the landowner said, pay the last first. He wanted them to hear this. He wanted the ones that had been there early on to hear what he was paying the ones that came last first. And he paid them exactly the same thing. Well, their human assumption, and this is how most of the time we think, and I'm not saying it's never correct to think this way, but what they were thinking is, well, we have to be, we have to make more then. Because this one last one just, they only worked one hour. 
We worked all day in the heat of the day. And he gave us a denarius. He gave them a denarius. That's not fair. You ever heard that? That's not fair. Well, it depends on who we're asking. The source of righteousness is the key here. The problem is every person that came from the womb of Adam and Eve came out of the womb self-righteous, with one exception, that's Jesus. Self-righteous. What does that mean? Well, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it infected all humanity with an assumption that they know right and wrong, good and evil, apart from God even being in the mix. We come out of the womb self-righteous. Now, I did not know that many years ago. What I did know is we come out of the womb sinners. And that is true. We come out of the womb rebellious. That is true. I didn't understand the concept of self-righteousness. It is one of the more damning of any of the issues that we deal with as a sinner, is self-righteousness. Because it will take you in a path that firstly will never take you to heaven, but it certainly can take you to hell. Self-righteousness. So Jesus is making a point here that I have come back and had to marvel at many, many times. What he's not saying is that there is no such thing as a system of what we might call fairness in the business world we live in, because there is such a thing. But he's talking about something else entirely because the parable is about the kingdom. And in the kingdom, things are different. In the kingdom of God, God thinks differently. And so he ended up giving the person that worked the least just as much as the one that had been there the longest. One of the problems that we deal with uh, as Christians that have been around a while is we could get self-righteous about how we look at some of the young whippersnappers that are coming up. You know what I mean? And what is it? Well, God gave them the same thing He gave us. And we've been working all these years trying to walk with obedience and do the will of God, which indeed we, we have. And here comes somebody that's brand new and God gives them the same eternal life He gave me. Gave them the same Jesus He gave me. And some would say, well, that's not fair. Well, absolutely it is because the righteous one did it. There is only one source of righteousness, and that word righteousness, if you look at it in the English language, is rightness. Right. What is right? What is right? I hear it said in companies these days, well, do what is right. Do the right thing. Well, okay, but maybe they don't know what that is. Maybe they do and maybe they don't. Deuteronomy 32.4 says, God is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways, they are justice. He's a God of truth. He's without injustice. This is our God we're talking about. He is righteous and upright is he. Period. There is no source of what right is apart from God. That tree of the knowledge of good and evil messed us up to think we can tell what right is without even involving God. I've told the story, I'm going to tell it again, and I don't tell it well. But R.C. Sproul, years ago, uh, went out on one of the beaches at spring break. And he, there's these high school and college kids that are just doing what they do, they're partying. So he had a mic and a camera, and he would catch these kids as they walked by and ask them if they'd stop for a minute, and he could ask them some questions, and most of them would. And he would ask various things, but one of the things he said to them, every one of them, and there were dozens, every one of them, one at a time, do you think you know absolutely what is good and what is right for your life? Every one of those suckers said yes. Not one of them said, because I know the Lord, and He is the righteous one, and He guides me. Not one of them said that. But every one of them, said, yes, I know what's right for me. I know what's good for me. And you know what? No, they don't, apart from God. Now in Christ, He will show us what is good and what is right. Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all His ways. He is kind in all His works. Genesis 18, 25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
And the answer is yes. He always will. But let me tell you about the judge of the, the whole earth, of the righteous one. Sometimes he may surprise you. He has me more than once through the years. Surprised me in what he considered to be right. You know, I would not necessarily have gone that, that way. But then he comes along and says, here is what righteous is. Here is what righteousness is. Let me show you. So what I had to do and I continue to try to do, like saying I haven't ever failed and still couldn't yet. And that is when I come upon a matter or an issue of life that I need to know what right really is, first thing I need to do is not assume I know. I need to go back to the one that is right, the righteous one, and ask him, then what is right here, Lord? What do you want me to do that is right? Well, you know this, but Christ, he became our righteousness. We don't even have any righteousness apart from God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Of him, that's of God, you are in Christ Jesus. That was God's doing. He put us in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. This is, this is a part of what God showed me in Galatians 2.20 many years ago. I have no source of life apart from Jesus. I have no source of righteousness apart from Jesus. I have no source of goodness apart from Jesus. But in Christ, I have all of that. And what God showed me, I remember going to McDonald's one night when Christy and I were early married. That was our, you know, that's what we ate. It was health food, you know. We, went, we either ate that or pizza almost every day of the week. And we went to McDonald's. It was after, at the end of a day. We had gone to school and worked and done the things we were doing. And I was talking to her about something that stood out to me. I said, you know, it just occurs to me that prior to Jesus going back to be with the Father, there never was a man in heaven. There wasn't one. Now, in the future, there'll be a lot of us, men and women, there was never one. But now there is one, the God-man. Yeah, he's still God. Yeah, he's also man. And then I also came to understand that he will be my righteousness when I get my new body and I'm there as much as he is now. There will never be a time in my forever to come but what he is still the source of my righteousness. My life, my eternal life. He will always, 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 always be my source. I guess somehow I thought when we got to heaven and got rid of these sin-filled bodies that we would just default to being the source of righteousness ourselves, and we're not. We will never be. It will always be Him. But see, that's okay because that's how God made us. He made us to have our completion in Him. Christ became for me my righteousness. I don't have it apart from him, but in him, I have it. So, here's what happens. This happened uh, just a few days ago for me. Situation arose I won't get into at this moment. And that was I needed to take the information that was brought my way and decide what God himself determines right would be. Not what my human mind kind of defaults to. Because you know you have that, I have that. And sometimes that doesn't mean it's wrong. Sometimes what our minds default to as being right probably is because we've been with the Lord for quite a while. But that doesn't mean it's always true. And it's dangerous for a Christian to just assume that they know what right and wrong is without asking the one that is the source of the right and the wrong. The Lord himself is the righteous one. He's the one. Uh, you'd say, yeah, but I'm... I'm 69 years old. I've been with the Lord for many, many, many years. I've learned a lot of things. And the answer is always true. Yes, that's right. But does that mean I always know at this very second, at this moment, what right is for this one occasion? And the answer is no, I don't. Until he shows me. Until I know. And then when you know, you know what they say? When you know, then you know. Right? The motive and the quality, he said, not only are the first last and the last first, but he also said, uh, there are going to be many called and few chosen. The motive and the quality of our service as a Christian 
is more important than how long you've done it. Now let me clarify that. He cares about those of us that have been Christians for a lot of years and walked with the Lord and as they would say, and borne the heat of the day. We've gone through some stuff, haven't we? Everyone in this room has been around for a little while. Some of us a little longer. But you know, that's okay. That's a good thing. But just because I have been a Christian for 25, 30, 50 years, 70 years, does not mean that somehow I have risen to be more important and more valuable than someone that's more brand new in the kingdom. Now, I probably have more experience and probably a little more human and spiritual wisdom at the same time. And I hope that's true. But you know, I've, I've known Christians that got old and died. And you know, unless the Lord does something different, we all will. At some point, we'll go to be with the Lord. They've gotten old and they've died and I've, I've sensed the older they got, the more self-righteous they got. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Now that's my opinion, of course, my discernment, and God will sort that out with each individual, of course. But the older I get with the Lord, the less self-righteousness should be coming through because every day I'm taking up the cross and following the Lord. And I'm giving up the tree of the knowledge of good and evil every time I go to the cross and I'm taking up the righteousness of Jesus, the tree of life, and I'm changing and I'm becoming different. We really are. We're becoming different. He's transforming us from glory to glory in His image. And so God does care about those of us that have been around for a long time. He does. But He still cares about the motive of our service and the quality of it still more than the length of our service. I've heard it said uh, that that guy was a Christian, he didn't end well. Came to the end of his life, he didn't end well. Well, that would depend on God to really answer if that be true. But I think I have seen that. I've, I think I've seen people that did better in their faith and walking with the Lord and walking in love that Kelly was talking about when they were younger than they did when they got older and it should not be like that. Now the older we get, let me, let me see if you guys have ever noticed this. We're not quite as strong as we used to be as we get a little older. We're not quite as fast. We're not quite as agile. There are, you know, there's a list. You know, you know the list? We have probably more aches and pains than we remember having as a child or a young person. Things are somewhat different. And, and I recognize that that's not a bad thing. That's just kind of the process that we're going through. But the older I get in the Lord, the sweeter I need to become in the Spirit. The more loving I need to become. The more merciful and gracious and forgiving I need to become. And I will tell you, I've seen some of my Christian brothers and sisters that have gone before me that that's indeed how it was. I saw that. Oh, it was beautiful. But then I have seen some of my brothers and sisters that in their latter years, they got what I call crotchety. They got stuck in their ways. They got frustrated with the younger generation, which let's face it, there's times that we will be. Sometimes the young can get, get a little annoying with their I know everything kind of thing. But love and mercy. You know, you want to see what I'm talking about. There's an old man that wrote uh, three letters in the Bible. His name was John. Now, he wasn't an old man when Jesus chose him. He was the youngest of the disciples, at least they think he was. He was probably a teenager, John when God chose him to be a, an apostle, a disciple. But then when he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then also wrote Revelation, he was probably 50 or 60. There's some people think he was up close to 90. I don't believe that's true. But he was an older man, probably at least my age. And you know, 1st John, every, every third or fourth sentence, he said, my little children, you need to love one another. My little children, you need to love one another. My little children, you need to love one another. He said, love is of God. He said, perfect love casts out fear. He couldn't say it enough. And here was an older man that God had sweetened him over time. Because, you know, him and his brother, had a, Jesus had a nickname for them when they were younger. He, they were called sons of thunder. They weren't sweet. 
They'd chop you up and run you down to get what they're looking for. He's not like that. John's not like that in these latter years. Now he's suffering. He's at Patmos when he wrote Revelation, probably breaking rocks as an older man, doing physical labor in a very, very bad climate and a, and a terrible situation. And you know you wouldn't know that if he didn't tell you. He wasn't belly aching and complaining about that one place in that whole letter he wrote Revelation, nor in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. But what he does is, is this sweetness, the, the love, the mercy, the gratitude of what God has done keeps working deeper in him as he gets older. That's beautiful. I pray God, let that be me. Let me be like that. The older I get, I'm not going to be quite as fast and not as strong and I might have some aches and pains. But Lord, give me the grace to be merciful and loving and kind to people. And so the motive and the quality of our service matters. Matthew 20, verse 16 said, the last will be first and the first will be last. Matthew 20, verse 25 says this, Jesus called them to himself and said, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles, they like to lord it over the people, lord it over them. And those who are great, they exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. I'm going to talk of that this week and next week both. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Give his life a ransom for many. Here is the thing. Do you want to be first? The first and the last. We're going to get to a parable here in a moment that talks of that further. Do you want to be first? He said, then you're going to be a great servant. Because the first of all is Jesus. He is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. He's number one. And the first of all became, and still to this day, is the greatest servant that ever has been. He said, you want to be great? Become a servant. Christ's likeness, that's who we are. We care about others more than ourselves. That's what a servant is. Matthew 7, 20. By their fruits, you will know them, Jesus said. So not only is the quality here, we're talking about the, the taste worthiness, the, the, the quality of the fruit. It's more important to give than to get. Have you ever heard that before? Now, God gives us a lot of things. He's constantly giving to us. What he did through Christ that's still ongoing is constant giving. And yet one of the characteristics of a person that's coming to be mature, the first rather than the last, let's say it that way, is someone that's not only a servant, but they care about people and they'd rather give than get, even though getting is still not a bad thing. They look for opportunity to be givers in, high, in life in every kind of way. Now going along with that, Jesus said, many are called and few are chosen. Well, that's very simple for me to understand now. Jesus' sheep, they know him, and he knows them. Matthew 20, verse 16, he said, many are called and few are chosen. But John 10, 14 says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known by them. He said, many are called Few are chosen, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, he's saying there is something about how we get there is that we are a people that obey. The obedience doesn't take you to heaven. It's the result of who you are that is taking you to heaven. You're an obeyer. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This, this, this proverb, this word has baffled me at times because I've thought, how could someone that Jesus doesn't even know be able to do some of those things? Now, we're not saying that they actually were being led by the anointed God when they 
when they prophesied in his name or they cast out demons or they did wonders. There are people, I don't know how much you're aware of this, but there are people through the latent power of the soul and with the demonic help can do miracles. It's been all, all in all of history we've known this. In the Old Testament, uh, Pharaoh had his magicians and they actually could do miracles. Not necessarily at the same level our God can, but they could do miracles. When I was going to Bible college years ago, we would have missionaries come and speak to us. And, and one of them in particular, I remember he had spent most of his life in India. And he said, I want to tell you something. Those demonic inspired, demonically inspired people, uh, witchcraft and various other things that were going on, he said, I saw miracles, but they weren't God. They weren't our God. So just by itself, miracles don't necessarily prove God or not God. But God does do that too because we saw it with Jesus. We saw it with the apostles. But I've wondered, how could it be that these people did this? And they even called him Lord, but he really wasn't. And Jesus said, I just never knew you. And he said, depart from me, you're practicing lawlessness. Meaning you have, you're on that side, not this side. You're not with me. And I, I think this is a very sobering word for those of us that have been around a while, for people that are actually thinking they're going to heaven and they are not. That's a sobering thing, isn't it? And he said, many are called, few are chosen. What's this about? Well, it's, it's not just because of what they do. It's because they know Jesus. That's what he said. I know you, I don't know you. You gotta know him. You gotta know him. You hear me say this all the time. But then when we know him, what we do does matter. We're to obey. He said, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? You know, why is that? Many are called, he said, but few are chosen. Second Timothy 2.19, Paul says it this way, the Lord knows those who are his. I, I'm not going to get into the uh, theology of God choosing his people. But I will tell you what Jesus said. He said, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. No one does. And everybody wants to say, well, what about those others? Does he not draw everybody else? And I said this many years ago. I had never even thought to say it this way, but I was being provoked by some of the people in our church. This was troubling them. They would, they would say, what do you mean? Does he not call everybody? And the answer to that is, yes, he actually does. But then... Some, it doesn't appear that they're drawn to the Lord for some reason. Why is that? And so these people would ask me and they would provoke me, kind of like people did with Jesus in his day. And they would say, well, what about this person over here? Does that mean God wants them to go to hell? And I said, you know what? There's only two kinds of circumstances in all of this world. Those things that are my business and those things that are not my business. And you're asking me something that's not my business. What I can tell you is, I know he came and got me. I'm not saying I'm better and greater than those people because I'm not. The less than the least of the saints is what Paul called himself. I'm not better or greater. Why did he come get me? I don't know, but he did and I'm glad he did. But what I found out about these people that were having such a problem with this theology was, they were not worried about themselves going to heaven because they believed they were. They believed God had chosen them. They were worried about some of these other people. And I said, what I do is I pray. And we try to share the life with these folks you're talking about. And, and we try to live the life before them. And I pray. And I say, Father, draw them to yourself. We had a funeral here a couple of weeks ago with some family, Christy and Sherry's family and uh, some of these people may know the Lord and some may not. I don't know for sure who all does and doesn't. Uh, we could pretend we do, and that's not my job either. Now, you can kind of taste the fruit uh, along the way, can't you? But, but I knew when I was speaking just a very short amount of truth that morning, that day. I guess it was afternoon. That, Lord, this word is alive, so you take it and you apply it to the ones that you want to apply it to. But what I do pray is that you would draw everyone to yourself.
Father, I pray you'll draw all these to yourself. Now, doing the will of God from the heart, Matthew 21, we're going into another teaching of Jesus. Verse 28, he said, what do you think? Jesus said that, I used to, I kind of picked that up from a friend of mine. I used to go up to somebody and say, what do you think? And, and almost every time it'd catch them off guard because, you know, although they probably were thinking something, probably didn't want to tell me what that was, but I'm not really caring that I know. It's just one of those things I said, what do you think? But Jesus said, what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and he said, son, go work today in my vineyard. That son answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and he went. Then he came to the second son and said, likewise. And that son said, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? That was the question Jesus posed. And they said to him, well, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. He was talking to those Pharisees, Sadducees, the Herodians. He said, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots, they believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. He's saying, listen. Sometimes these self-righteous religious people, and you've known a couple through your days, haven't you? I'm not saying we should hate them or despise them, but I'm telling you there are some people that are very self-righteous in their religiosity, even in those that name the name of Christ. It was the self-righteous that killed Jesus. Self-righteous Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, the Sanhedrin, the Jews, religious people, and they had him killed. And so it has been through the history that oftentimes a lot of the persecution that can come to a Christian comes from the self-righteous Christians. Not all of it, but some of it. And he said, you know, you guys, John, he brought the message of righteousness and you didn't believe him. But there were a lot of people he called the tax collectors and harlots. That was, and that was his way of saying they're the scum of the earth, right? And he said, but they believed. And he said, and you saw this and you should have then seen that and it should have caused you to repent. But he said, it didn't work. You didn't repent. Now we're not just talking about our service or our work here, but it's part of that too. He had two sons, the landowner. He said to the first son, he said, go work in the vineyard. That son, I'm not going to do that. But he actually repented and he went and did it. Second son said, yeah, I'll do that, Dad. But he didn't go. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen both of those in my lifetime. I've seen both of those. I really don't like either one perfectly because the first guy shouldn't have said, nope, I'm not going to do that. He should have humbled himself the, the second his dad asked the question. But he didn't. But then he did. So he humbled himself. So the last will be first. The first may be last. Ephesians 6, we talked about this a week or two ago. I just want to touch it briefly about how we're to think about what we do for the Lord. Paul says, verse 5, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. That means your bosses here on the earth. With fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. You know, I could have just given you that and said that's the message today. That everything we do, sincere hearts obeying the Lord. Does he use authority on this earth? Of course he does. You guys, some of you in this room, have some of that in your business place. And we all have authority above us. Everyone does at some level. He said, I want you to do that with a sincere heart as to Christ. Not with eye servants, as, eye servants as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You know, I heard this all my life. I'm glad I did. I'm not saying I always did it. But I'm glad I did. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord. See, Paul has a point here. We're not working for Cox Hospital or DirecTV. We are, but really 
ultimately, we're working for the Lord. He said, you're working, doing good service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. 1 Peter 2, we read this just a week or two back, verse 18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. If you have not had some harsh bosses, you lucky duck. <laughs> I would be shocked if you've lived your life and haven't had a few. Because I think God wants us to have that sometimes. Now, I prefer good bosses. I prefer those that are kind and, and caring. They can be author authoritative, but kind and caring. I prefer that. But I've had both. And he said, you need to be submissive to both. For this is commendable, Peter says, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. And we have at times, haven't we? What credit is it if when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? He said, you deserve it when you, <laughs> you did something wrong, you need to be whooped. He said, there's no credit to that. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, he said, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called. What he's saying is part of your life you will suffer some as a Christian. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, when they were spitting on him and and insulting him and throwing rocks at him and, and doing all this beating him. When all of that was happening, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. What did Jesus say right before he died? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now that's quite a thing to say. When they have shamed you, ridiculously shamed you, hung you on a cross, beat you nearly to death, stuck a spear in your side, crammed a, 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 thorn, a, a, a crown of thorns on your head, and they're shooting insults at you as fast as they can. And you're dying in front of your mother and your family and people that care about you. And what did he say? Right before he died, he gave up his spirit to the Father, but right before he died, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This was Jesus, because he judges righteously. Romans 14, 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. This kind of cap encapsulates the, the message here today. I don't belong to myself. But that's okay. In fact, that's a good thing. I told Craig this morning when we were talking about it, some subjects, I said, you know, I'm not God. And that's a good thing, and I'm kind of glad that's true. Now, I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. But I'm not God. Now, that doesn't take me off the hook of doing right and living righteously. But what it does is it takes me back to, I need to hear from Him. And so Paul said it this way. He said, if I live... I live to Jesus, I live to God. If I die, I die with the Lord, I go be with Him. At one point he said, I think that would be better for me right now to go be with the Lord, because he continually was getting beaten within an inch of his life and thrown into prisons. But he said, I think I'm gonna be here for just a little while longer. What we do matters. What you do is not why you go to heaven. But what you do is a result of who we are on our way to heaven. And Jesus talked about rewards more than any other writer in the scriptures. I'm talking about heavenly re rewards. He talked more about it than anyone else because that's, that's a part of the package. But what I want to do is I want to make my service for the Lord quality. I want my motive to be the right motive, that I'm not just loving or giving because I want something in return, but I'm doing it because I do it like he does it. 
doesn't mean we never get anything back from people, their love or their gratitude or whatever. But these parables today had a lot to do with what we do. And what we do does matter. The world is watching us. As I've said many times, what's going to determine ultimately whether they believe in Jesus is whether or not we walk in unity of spirit and faith, you and I. But they're also watching what we do, right? They're watching how we do things, the good or the bad of it. They're watching us. Some people think, no, they're not watching me. That's not true. Everybody gets watched. And, and, and this is okay because this is the way it works. We are the light. And what is going to be a part of what changes this pretty messed up world that we're living in right now is more of that light shining through the people that have it. More of the rightness to shine through. More of the love to shine through. More of the goodness of God. Craig, you want to help me, please? Father, thank you for saving me through Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you became for us, what you did for us. And Lord, you gave us a pattern. Lord, when you were here, you gave us a pattern for how human beings need to live this life. And you became a servant. And you gave everything. And you said, that's what we're supposed to do. Become servants give lay down our lives for one another this is what we are called to because the first they are going to be last sometimes and the last they're going to be first and lord it's not because we're wanting to be first as much as we want to please when we stand before you i want you to be able to say that you're well pleased when you see jesus in us you're pleased but you expect us to let that Jesus live through us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's not all, no longer it's me living, it's Christ living in me. And Lord, today I want, to, I want to shine the glory of Jesus more than I ever have. I want the church to shine the glory of Jesus more than we ever have. And Lord, let us recognize that you're the source of righteousness. You're the one that says what is right and what is not. Such boundless love, unending joy. This is my life. It's what I know. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you selected me, Jesus, my Lord. It's you I owe. Let's sing it one more time. Boundless love, boundless love, unending joy. This is my life And it's what I know I'm so glad That you selected me Jesus, my Lord It's you that I owe Jesus, my Lord, it's you that I owe.